once again, folks, welcome and thank you for coming. And no biblical references for me for the afternoon session, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, our session this afternoon is on data analysis and mobile payments. And our intention is to focus on the generation of data as it's happening online and offline, and especially offline, I think, a bit, and how it's being used, in this case, for marketing, for accounting, for cost accounting, which is a big piece of the pie, and for other purposes. So again, welcome. And with that, we will begin with our three panelists, Ben Hurley, Jared Burke, and Kate Podachowski. I got close, I'm from <laughs> Chicago, I should. <laughs> and let's begin with Ben. And you have up to five minutes to tell us what you'd like to tell us. Fantastic. You can talk about the Cubs versus the Sox if you want. <laughs> I, I don't even know the score, but I'll, I'll go for it. But my name is, is Benjamin Hurley. Um, I represent a company called Apriva. So some of you will have heard of us, others won't. Some of you are our partners in the audience. I've seen you. Um, for those that don't know who we are, uh, you've probably processed a payment either through one of our made-for-purpose terminals, a vending machine, maybe a car wash, mobile point of sale, semi-integrated tablet system. Um, we're a gateway that has a significant market share here in the US and internationally. We develop uh, proprietary you know, IP mobile point of sale products, SDKs. Um, we serve the ISV, ISV community uh, significantly. Um, so that's kind of our business. Our customer base are large FIs, processors, telco companies, uh, domestically, internationally. I'm, I'm not pitching the company here. I've been on the other end of too many panels where it's kind of like a PR spin around, you know, what is it you're offering? The, the reason I'm kind of uh, positioning what we do um, is where do we sit in the data relationship between uh, the consumer and the merchant? So um, we're in a kind of a unique position where we own the point of sale application, the, the IP and the gateway. So we're kind of in the highway between two sets of data. Um, the first one I like to refer to as the uh, semi-personalized data. <clears throat> that basically consists of the, uh, the, the business information, you know, the vertical, um, which area are they in, what's the SIC title, subtitle, uh, you know, are they uh, food and beverage, are they retail, health, et cetera. Um, you know, what are they processing? What are they doing? Average transaction volume, uh, monthly, annually, what's the retention rate? And then on the, on the mobile side, um, because we developed the IP, the, the native mobile payment applications, we have the anonymized data. Um, so they're, they're basically two sets of data that we can leverage. And my position on this panel is, is probably going to be slightly different to my peers here who are maybe more focused towards the consumer. But we're in the, in the acquiring business. So our partners are acquirers. Um, our business benefits from them obtaining new customers, uh, merchants, small businesses. So my position will be um, around, you know, what do we do with that data that we have access to in order for them to grow their business? Um, there's a number of areas, essentially. Um, but what we do is, is we, we aggregate, consolidate that data into what we refer to as the optimum uh, merchant profile for their specific vertical. So uh, as, as kind of the questions go through, um, keep in mind that's my position, and I'll, and I'll talk to um, how, how we approach uh, data and mobile payments from that regard. Great, great. And then um, I'm going to actually run over to Jarrett and Kate. I can leave you for last if you don't mind. So, Sure. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jarrett Burke. I, I represent a company called Innovate Tech here in Chicago. We are uh, primarily focused on the business-to-business -business, uh, market where we're building apps, uh, primarily middleware between the payment processor and the merchant to allow for vertical-specific uh, solutions to be built to help basically improve business processes, um, mm. taking a lot of the transaction data and benchmarking, <clears throat> benchmarking that against um, uh, their, their historical business and finding ways to um, essentially help them save money, uh, reduce costs, um, improve cash flow, uh, whether that be through integrating a, a payment link on their website that, that ties into their accounting software such as QuickBooks or something more advanced uh, as uh, dealing directly with software as a service uh, platforms where they're trying to roll out, maybe it's a new, um, they want to integrate some new crypto currency or otherwise. Um, so most of the data that we, we deal with is primarily on the uh, our client's uh, side. And uh, 
more so in the traditional model, not so much in the uh, not so much in the emerging uh, uh, blockchain type technology. So, cool. And Kate has been one very busy person the last few months for sure. <laughs> if you could give us. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I am Kate Panahusky. I am um, product manager at Walgreens. So we have been very involved in mobile payments since the actual launch of Google Wallet um, and Passbook. Well, what formerly was Passbook, now Apple Wallet. Um, we actually launched the ability to pay at the terminal in 2011 with Google Wallet, um, then rolled it out chain-wide. Um, we've been at the top of mind with Passbook when it originally launched and the ability to save your Balance Awards card um, into Passbook. Recently though, um, in October, we launched Apple Pay. Um, so we, we included Balance Awards cards um, and the ability to tap for payment um, and then also tap for loyalty. Most recently though, um, we had a big press release, I believe last Monday, that focused on Android. So we, for both platforms, we were the first retailer to allow the ability um, for tapping for loyalty and then tapping for payment. Cool. Actually, before I go to the general questions, um, two specific ones. One for, um, first to begin with Ben, as you go through the B2B, and I've always imagined it this way, that I can take the data from the transactions and use it for my accounting systems. Can I use that for my accounting and then the cost account to figure out what my profit and my expenses from that data and then where to market from there? Ben or? I'm Ben. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. sorry Ben, sorry, Jared. Jared, uh, I blew we, it, We sorry. look similar, so. Yeah, right. Jared, we'll ask you first, and then. Um, yeah, so uh, we are starting to just take a look at that data because some of some of our customers are traditional building materials type companies or um, what I'll classify as behind the times type of businesses that really don't know what to do with the data. Uh, like us venture we're capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just starting to kind of uh, take that data from our customers and specifically with some of these new uh, applications that we're building. Like I said, it's <clears throat> more or less providing them insights into their business that they haven't seen. And primarily the uh, ability to uh, receive payments and uh, we're, we're all about eliminating paper. That's kind of our goal. Uh, whether that's invoices, whether that's, um, you know, uh, checks uh, written. What we're trying to do is take a customer from the time that they deliver their goods or services, send out an automatic automatic email. Uh, the customer, their customer, then is able to click on a link, pay that through ACH or a, a credit card, and so that's it's transforming their business that way from a cash flow perspective. And otherwise, the the a lot of the the costing and uh, some of the their d vendor data as well. We're starting to uh, kind of look at that as well with them. So. Colin, Kate, on a specific thing for you. This morning in the panel, they spent a lot of time talking about EMV and EMV rollout. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you were involved with that, but how has the EMV gone for Walgreens, if you're able to answer that? And yeah, I think it's gone um, pretty well. It's actually been um, something we've been working on for a while now. Um, it's also incorporating um, what we've been doing with mobile payments, so it's a long process for us, but um, once we got EMV set up, it made it a lot easier for us to um, start working on both mm -hmm. Android and Apple Pay. Has it improved adoption of Android and Apple Pay for you? Is it easier for me to use my phone than to wait for my chip to be read? It's much easier. Um, <laughs> it's actually quite fast. Um, we've done a couple of um, studies on it, nothing I can really share publicly, um, no. but we, we have been seeing the improvement and the convenience factor. You don't have to fumble um, at the point of sale and enter the wrong number. I actually did that recently and entered um, uh, oh. the wrong character and had to go back and start over. Um, it, it just makes it seamless for the customer to just tap once and not remember anything. We take out all the work for them. So I always forget my number when I use my balance rewards yeah. card, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it goes. And then, Ben, one more specific. Can you talk about the acquirers and how are they viewing the world and how do they view the interface at this point? Yeah, so um, one of the things we do beyond provide payment facilitation is um, the, the acquisition piece, the, the acquirers. And what we're, we're heavily involved in at the moment is the 
um, preparation and disclosure of, of the data that allows them to acquire new businesses for the, the least investment. So reducing the CPA, um, essentially if they, if they are the acquirer that own the application, the financial gateway data, they have a, a very broad insight into the, the profile of their customer. Um, we work arm in arm with their sales and marketing organization, their, their groups, um, to provide those data points for extremely targeted customer acquisition. Now, I mean, it, with payments, you know, the, the kind of the business sphere in general in, in the US is moving towards mobile. So what we do is we work with them um, to prepare and, and allocate uh, marketing and acquisition funds towards new business acquisition uh, via those those data elements. So that could be, you know, a combination of social, Facebook ads, I mean, Google paid search, premium app store listings. If they own the data and they have the data, they, they understand the, the optimum profile. So there is uh, the, the CPA or, or in the mobile world, for, for those of you that are familiar, the CPPU, the, the cost per paying user is, is greatly reduced when you have the, the, the data in front of you. Um, what that allows them to do uh, and we promote this heavily because obviously them acquiring new businesses is in our interest. You know, as a gateway and platform provider, we, we operate on a license fee or a per transaction basis point fee. If we can assist them to scale and grow, um, it's in our benefit. So we share the data with them, we consult them on the data, um, and it is evolving. Um, essentially what you have is, is, is digital and uh, you know, paid search campaigns that, that bring in um, new business, basically generated from their existing customer portfolio. So it, it's kind of a, you know, a re-education process for some of the more traditional uh, players in the space. And if you're dealing with FIs and, and gateways, this is all new to them. Um, but it, certainly in places like Silicon Valley, I mean, this is standard. Um, but that, that's kind of what we're doing with the data to grow our business and their business as well. Okay, and then um, to the more general questions then. What do you guys see as the current trends in the generation of data? How are you guys getting it? And then how do you see it as the most common use today for data amongst your client bases? Or in your case as a client, <laughs> amongst your customers? <laughs> ben, do you want to start me, off? Me, okay. Sure, um, we'll go this way, towards right. me. <laughs> Clockwise. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost, again, going back to my point, the, the gateway level, the, the transactional, the personalized, the, the anonymized, the, the, those are two data sets. Um, the, the predictive element, you know, what's the kind of the, the re retainment rate, what's the kind of net worth of, of the customer over the lifetime span, um, and what do you do that with that from a, you know, acquiring, but then kind of a retention standpoint. Um, you know, there's, there's purposing of that data to bring in new business, but then there's utilization of that data to retain and, and monetize um, existing users. And I think that's, um, you know, those two areas are probably the most interesting. It's an educational process. Um, teaching these organizations around these, these kind of fundamentals is, uh, is not easy, um, but they're, they're certainly moving towards um, those type of uh, hypotheses and approaches, yeah. And Kate, how are you guys? Oh, well, it's a, a bit different for us as a retailer. Um, I think the education piece that for our consumers is very important because we don't have um, everyone interested in mobile payments. So we're slowly seeing people gravitate more to just carrying their phone rather than um, their wallet and pulling all of that out and messing with everything at um, at the actual point of sale. Um, we're using our data though to make sure we're presenting the right information at the right time to the customers, uh, making sure they're getting notification of when their refill's ready, um, the ability to go in, get it right away, check out seamlessly. Um, the convenience factor again is mm -hmm. huge for us, um, especially given that Walgreens can be everywhere. We wanna make sure our customers enjoy their experience and continue to come back to us. Are you able to do it live so that while I'm in the store, you can use beacons or other technology to measure what I'm doing and what I'm looking at? <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we are not necessarily using beacons, but um, we do have geolocation in place so we, we can see everything um, somewhat real time. I know it's a little bit difficult not having Wi-Fi in our stores um, and Walgreens can somewhat be underground. I'm not sure if anyone has visited the... Um, the Wicker Park store that is in a bank vault. Um, so let's say you go downstairs to the vitamin vault, um, 
you typically could lose connection there. So um, we do what we can uh, to get all of that information and then we repurpose it as well to make sure we're delivering the best experience. I was just admiring the store in the state of Illinois building, the Thompson Center, which is round to curve, and it curves along with the sides of the building, and I had to notice that. It was actually quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So Walgreens Architects have done a great job lately, so in building <laughs> new things. So, and Jared, how, how are you looking at the space? And um, yeah, there? we're seeing a lot of the same, same as, as Walgreens, a lot of the customization uh, of our clients using, yeah, generating or using that data. Um, integrations with their systems, their ERP systems, their um, back-end systems, or their third-party apps that they're using uh, otherwise. Um, and then really the, the transaction aggregation, uh, looking at that data of what they're doing in any given time. Uh, not so much, we haven't got so much into the geo, because we're not really focused on the consumer. Um, so we're not really, well, one thing that we are uh, starting to use the, the geolocation for is more things like um, locating shipments uh, that, that uh, the, the client can pull open on their app and say, okay, uh, you know, my shipments in Hinsdale, it'll be here in, in a half hour, and okay, great, I can plan that out, and starting to use that data more effectively to essentially um, pre predict inventories, um, uh, and then commu ultimately communicate to their customer to better, uh, to provide some better customer service. Actually, sitting at lunch, you're talking about the B2B with one of the companies that's here and how they're looking for alternatives for payment for the product delivery and things like that. I thought that was quite interesting because I'd never even thought of it. Instead of cash or check, can use electronic. I'd be curious, I think we'll begin down with Ben. On the B2B side, on the inventory side really for Walgreens, have you begun to use the data that's available, and what do you see as the use of data going forwards a couple of years? In, uh, in, in terms of payment acceptance? Uh, payment acceptance and even inventory. Yeah. Like, you know, if you yeah. can have vitamin C at Walgreens and they've yeah. run out, would, can they figure that out? Or Pepsi-Cola yeah. or Coca-Cola or you so, know, Gatorade? Right. <laughs> so, so, so from a product level, I mean, inventory tracking from a, <clears throat> a business owner's perspective is, is critical, right? Um, certainly we we integrate those types of back-end systems for <coughs> stock replenishing you know stock redemption tracking integrations with with back-end systems um, that that's really what mobile offers that traditional made-for-purpose <coughs> terminals doesn't um, you know the, the the mobile capability the the api's the, the interfacing with third-party applications um, obviously makes it a, a far more robust platform and and that's kind of key you know when you when you're talking about uh, small business owner investing $950 in a made-for-purpose terminal versus half of that in a mobile solution that can connect to multiple um, third-party applications via three-legged OAuth authentication, any of those mechanisms that are out there. Um, that's far more uh, appealing to them. And, and we look at that, you know, both from our cu customer's perspective and ours in, in terms of growing market share on a, on a regular basis. So absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be great if we were there um, to have that real-time tracking. Inventory is a little bit difficult to um, capture at a Walgreens since um, we have many people in and out of the doors. So um, we do as best we can to have that real-time data saying, okay, something's there. Um, but what we do instead is give you a range. So we can predict, okay, um, instead of saying, you know, there's only one left, we, we say there's one to three bottles of your shampoo. Um, it's, it's the closest we're going to get until we actually have our um, employees and our suppliers using mobile in, in the actual store or while stocking the shelves, something we don't have currently, um, but would be very helpful and interesting. I did think it would definitely help our customers if we were there. Jared, any thoughts on? Um, yeah, I think the same, you know, kind of what I was just elaborating, elaborating mm -hmm. on. Um, very, very similar. I mean, we're... Look, starting to look at that data uh, to use it out, outside of just um, just the transaction itself and um, tie that into a lot of their their uh, w what they traditionally haven't looked at before in terms of um, uh, what what can they what other uses outside of okay the customer has paid me and 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 how can we relate that payment or where they pay it or uh, how efficiently they can pay it. 
pay their, their invoice. Okay. And back to the consumer world here. So um, just curious, how do you use the loyalty programs, private label, other things to generate data? I, I know the Walgreens has balance mm -hmm. and so forth. How is, are you seeing that get adopted? And is it necessary to have two, three, four sources of the data coming in before it's effective? I would like to go first. <laughs> I, I could jump in from um, the Balance Awards perspective. So um, we've seen a lot of success with our Balance Rewards program. Um, we have a good amount of users who are actively participating in the program. Um, it, it's great for taking our data um, and analyzing what our customers are doing um, and how we can improve um, just as, as a company altogether. Um, I think it's it's great to have one program. I think when we get to um, multiple programs, or um, I, I think Jack brought it up earlier, um, multiple payments, app-specific payments with um, Starbucks or CVS Pay or Walmart Pay, um, I think that could get a little bit tricky and um, a little over the top. I would rather have one customer using one platform um, or, or one type of loyalty program um, have that that be through Apple, through Android, but um, at least we have one one <laughs> system that collects all of our data through through a Bounce Awards program. And then you end up with one database, so you know everything about me, whether I'm a Cubs fan or a Sox fan, <laughs> <I> <laughs> or a Bears we, fan or a Bulls I, fan. I guess we could get to that level if you we knew if you purchased um, a lot of the Cubs gear at, at one of the Wrigley Walgreens. I do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm on my way to the airport to buy souvenirs for people in other cities. Cubs gear everywhere. So <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> so <laughs> um, Yeah, I think that uh, that's becoming more and more pro uh, 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 more and more common these days, um, yeah. especially with the millennials. Um, I think that they're starting to get used to these uh, types of geolocation apps where they're, um, where they're in a specific, uh, whether it's Walgreens store or, or otherwise, and uh, they're able to utilize the rewards or, or uh, promotions or, or coupons whatever that might be, and mm. I think that that's gonna continue to be on the rise um, with a lot more retailers, but maybe even more so in the B2B space as well. That's interesting, that's interesting. Um, just to flip again a little bit, in the mobile wallets, which are a central part to everything, and our phones, my two phones, so what would you like to see added to the phones? What capability would you like to see come on that would be most helpful to your clients or to your, yourselves? Well, I think um, mobile payments are not going to be uh, just on a mobile phone. I think some of the, the things that we're seeing is that the Internet of Things is very real. and, and you see use that buzzword. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you're starting to see uh, companies like Honda and Visa partner up together and um, provide basically your car as a credit card. So I think... Um, the, the mobile wallet is expanding outside of just your mobile phone. Um, you, you've got things like uh, Google Hands Free where now you don't even need to take out your, your phone out of your, your purse or your back pocket. Um, it's automatically recognizing you when you go into a, a store, which I don't know if Walgreens is doing anything like that yet, but uh, it'll recognize you when you go into the store and you go up to the, the counter and say, and they essentially know who you are because you're in the store. So. I think that uh, the digital wallet is expanding outside of just the handheld device. Cool, Kate. How do you? Use? Yeah, I, I actually think hands free is um, a really cool idea. Just being able to walk in, say, I want to pay with Google. You have a camera pointing at me and recognize that um, you know that I'm the right person. Um, it's pretty easy to, to see the picture and then see the person standing and recognize that. She's there, um, and then you're done. I think that um, that saves a lot of trouble. I personally don't like um, having to go through my purse to get everything out, so um, I'd be really interested to see if that takes off. I know right now it's more of a quick service restaurant thing, um, but it would be, it just save a lot of time. Cool, Ben? Yeah, so we've taken a more kind of holistic approach to supporting consumer, what we refer to as consumer or, or wallet applications. Um, there was a gentleman up here speaking earlier today from Google, from, from Android Pay, that kind of alluded to their new capabilities, the, the loyalty API, the geo proximity. Um, we, we've integrated with that, and, and the Apple Pay has a similar 
mechanism. Um, if you look at anyone who's a developer out there, I, I strongly recommend look at just how robust um, their capabilities are. What they've essentially done um, is, is removed the need for a brand specific consumer application. Uh, they, they certainly still promote uh, and suggest that's a good way to go for businesses. But if you look at the back end on the API, it's really device specific. So it's Android or iOS, the, the digital gift, digital loyalty cards insert themselves into a mobile device and they can be redeemed at the point of sale, either via NFC or proximity. So, so they are essentially r removing the need for, for a branded, brand specific consumer application. Um, w you know, given the fact that we represent and, and brand and white label for large banks and processes and all sorts of players, that for us was the best way to go. Um, we, we don't have the resources, neither the time, to support multiple custom integrations for specific retail brands. And, and we feel they've, they've taken the, the best approach um, for the market. I mean, you don't need an app. If you've got an Android or, or an iOS device, you can install a, a card for payment means and redeem via contactless digital loyalty redemption. It's, it's very interesting. So actually, let's follow up with it. How do you two feel? Who do you feel wins? I think we got an answer from Ben Ready. Will it be the iOS and the Samsung Pay or a Chase Pay or an individual Starbucks Pay goes universal or, as I mentioned earlier, Uber Pay or some of that? Or another idea that I'm not thinking of at this moment, <laughs> the wins. Yeah, I, I think it's best to stay with um, operating system level, iOS and Android. Um, that, that's the approach we've taken at Walgreens. We don't want to integrate a uh, payment into the app right now. We do have our own Walgreens app where you can refill, you can print photos, you can clip coupons, um, but we don't think it's the place for payment at this time. We'd rather use the, the two wallets that have actually gone out of their way to make sure it's the best experience for a customer. Um, they, they've proven that um, people are actually using them, so we, we think the I wouldn't want to say winners, but um, the best approach is to stay with the wallets that are working. Um, we, we don't need to create our own. Um, and we also want to make sure there's, there's people who don't want to download the Walgreens app. We understand that some people um, just don't see the need for that. So having the ability to use um, Android or Apple while you're in the store, it, it's totally fine with us. It's getting customers engaged and um, out the door quicker. Right. And I think uh, the... I mean, ultimately the consumer wins. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of different options out there. Um, and I don't think, I, don't, I can't say that a specific platform will be the winner. You know, I think it's, yeah. it's hard to tell that right now, but um, uh, I think that what we're gonna see is a lot more of the, the, the banks essentially are, are in, in a different position than they found themselves in. With, with this new technology. So I think you're going to see a lot more of the, the banks, like with clear exchange, um, you know, we were already seeing that, the banks coming together saying, okay, well, what we're doing here doesn't make sense. And if any of you have used Chase Pay, you know, that, and not a Chase customer, you know that you can't use Chase Pay anymore. You have to use clear exchange. So um, I think that the, if there's any losers in this, it's probably the banks not being able to have that as much control as they have in uh, in historic in history uh, over your your money. Actually, let me ask you a quick one. Um, as you bring up Clear Exchange, for those who don't know, Clear Exchange is allowance of transfer of money, kind of like Venmo does or Chase Quick Pay, between different banks. So I can send money quickly to Ben using that. It's just been renamed Zella um, or Zell. I think Zell this week. Um, and they're going to try, it's a consortium of banks trying to get it because banks are afraid of losing the Venmo. And Venmo is owned by PayPal, and PayPal to some degree is an enemy for these people, even though it's a friend for all of us, of course. The PayPal people pay me for that. So <laughs> the question is, do you see a system like that coming on, uh, a Venmo or a clear exchange slash Zella slash whatever, or is that just so far down the road that it's not worth thinking about yet? Yeah, I, I, it's really all about our customers. So I think getting the Walgreens customer to uh, adopt the wallets, um, we're doing a good job, but it's a little too out there for them or for us to to really think that um, 
they would take a Venmo or would want that from, from the Walgreens stores. I, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. You, you have to think we have 8,000 stores with mm -hmm. a lot of customers. Um, I think that would be a small percentage of our, our customer base to actually adopt that. Do you, at Walgreens, and you just said with 8,000 stores, I mean, you have huge demographic differences. The store in Deerfield, Illinois is a lot different than the store that I just looked at the State of Illinois building. I mean, do you adjust per region or per store or do you go nationwide? Um, so we, we've done testing in a smaller scale um, before going nationwide, but um, at, at least for, for Google Wallet, um, when we originally launched in 2011, it was on a smaller scale before we actually moved to all 8,000. Um, now, we, when we did the, the Apple Pay integration and Android Pay, um, we went full scale. A little bit of testing just to make sure um, it's actually working, but we figured, you know, I, I travel, I want to make sure I have the same experience in this, this state and Randolph store versus when I go back to Detroit, and I, um, I, I don't want a different experience there. I want, want to make sure our customers can get everything that we offer in, um, all over the country. So whether it's on the B2C or the B2B side, is the same experience important to like the acquirers and to the merchants and to the financial institutions? Um, I'll, I'll kind of step back to the question Please. you posed to the lady here. But um, on, on the, the ACH side, the yeah. the uh, bank to bank, um, there's a big company in the UK called Zap who uh, tied up with all the, the major FIs in the country over there. Um, they've basically got a real-time ACH clearance uh, gateway essentially and what they've done that's very interesting from a mobile pa payments perspective is allowed for um, the bypassing of the processing platforms completely um, mm. so from an emer a merchant's perspective you know removing that 2.75 percent per tran is is uh, very compelling um, but not only that they've gone into you know QR code redemption on billboards to magazines and, and online as well um, they, they've really re released something. Not, I'm not like pitching on their behalf. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a very interesting. <laughs> Feel free. I just pitch for PayPal. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's a very interesting platform, um, and I think uh, people need to keep a, a close eye on that. I think mobile payments is evolving beyond kind of the the standard processing platforms. Yeah. You know, that's my last question. Is where we evolve to. So <laughs> we won't be that one. Um, any other thoughts on the B2B or on B2C and? Um, and then how do we, I forgot what the original question was. I, yeah, I was just, I was trying to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but basically, and I think it was basically how, you know, how does it evolve? And do you have to pay attention to the individual merchants and, oh, can one platform work nationwide and things like that? Um, in my space, I think uh, it very much matters uh, from a industry specific standpoint. I mean, some industries just, Aren't aren't going to be there. Some p industries are very m much more advanced. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I guess it's m making a lot of a lot of uh, people's lives a lot easier. But um, you know, I guess I don't know if you have any thoughts on the B two C side. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I think um, you know we want a universal experience across the board. Um, okay. I, I don't want a, a customer to um, feel like they're missing out because we, we haven't considered them and said, you know, we're not going to support it in this store. Um, we, we, we also make sure Dwayne Reed has a similar experience. Um, if anyone's not familiar, um, Walgreens also um, owns Dwayne Reed. So we also make sure we support that. You can use your um, wallets in the Dwayne Reed stores. We don't want that differentiated experience um, just because you, you, know, you didn't go into that Walgreens. We want to make sure it's um, everyone is happy. That I had a Dwayne Reed on my transaction. I'm showing it to somebody. I'm like, oh, God, this is not Walgreens, but yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so my view on, I think the question is, what's, where's it going, right? Well, yeah, where's it going? Well, where's it going is really kind of, I'll hold that off for, for a moment, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. So, because I think that's an important question as to where it's okay. going. Let me ask, are there any questions out there? Because I'm monopolizing the question asking. And Please.
accepting some touchless payment. I'm wondering if you have the ability to speak on um, your costs, your net effective rate, for example, on these transa transactions now that we're seeing uh, a dramatic increase in PIN preferred card transactions. At this time, I can't really share that information. Um, thank you for the question, but yeah, we, we haven't really gone through um, and, and release those um, numbers. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you can buy Walgreens stock. Yeah. Right? <laughs> We're not allowed to do that. Um, let me flip a, a little bit to you. The ma what do you see as the major obstacles towards use of data going forward? Is it management teams or the management team focus or the consumer or something else? It's, it's really uh, copyright. Who's the custodian? Um, how are you lo allowed to use it? Given the, the many components in the payment ecosystem, who, who is the true owner? of the data, and, and you need to be very careful. Um, it, the US is a bit more lax in the regulations, but if you deal in other markets, it's far more stringent. You, you just need to be careful as an organization how you store that data, how you, you repurpose that data, um, and, and what it is ultimately that you're doing with it. I think there needs to be kind of a, a broader consensus on um, you know, w what you're allowed to do with that data, quite frankly. It's, it's kind of opaque at the moment. Sort of a UN of data, huh? Yeah. <laughs> they can meet in New York and try to agree. <laughs> right. Okay, do you have a... Yeah, I, I think right now um, it's consumer trust. Um, I think getting customers to understand um, the data that we use will benefit them in the end um, and educating them on um, what we're doing with it. it it's we're, we're not going in um, and trying to manipulate the customer into spending more or um, encouraging them to buy something that they wouldn't. Um, what we're really trying to do is make sure they're they're happy um, and they're getting the right information. Um, I, I think building trust is is one of the, the biggest hurdles that um, we find through through wallets and just it, the data that we're capturing too. Yeah, I'll piggyback on it. Trust and transparency. Um, Two, two of the biggest issues, security. Um, a lot of the business owners and CFOs and people that we deal with are very concerned um, about implementing anything other than what they've traditionally done the last 30, 40, 50 years they've been in business. Um, they're used to that, seeing that physical check, and if you start talking to them and they, they don't really understand the whole uh, mobile payments or online payments world, uh, it scares them, and you just kind of have to educate them and say, Look, the, you know, the world's not going to end if, if you start accepting credit cards on your website. Um, so it's it's you know it's education to the to the merchant to say, you know, hey, it's, this is this is the future. If you don't start uh, catching up, you know, your competition will, uh, and you know, you could be left in the in the dust. And I'm going to ask this question on behalf of like Axiom and the other marketing companies. How do you deal with the differences between online and offline data? We've mostly been talking about the offline. But does online present different challenges, especially to Walgreens, which is mostly an offline store, but for all of your customers? How do you deal with those? And can you board both of those on and combine them so that you can better market to me? Yeah, da yes. data integrity is very important for our customers, especially in the healthcare space with, uh, with, with HIPAA. HIPAA regulations um, uh, and some of the other, uh, you know, we, we deal with a number of attorneys as well. So. <laughs> They're very sensitive uh, when we're talking about their data, where it's stored, who has access to it, um, all the end users on their network, and, and so forth. So yes, uh, it's a big issue for us we deal with on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, and I, I know um, Walgreens is known mostly for being brick and mortar, but we also um, sell product online. You can purchase it. Um, so we want to make sure we can match that up to understand um, where the process begins for the customer. Are they just researching on .com and then they move to the store or do they want to reorder um, and, and avoid the store altogether? So we want to make sure we, we can capture that and understand what they're using. Does your average online customer then begin on, or the average customer, they begin online and move to the store or are they just going straight to the store? Um, we see a lot of people just going straight to the store, but we, we've been working on um, actually integrating more of the mobile app so we can have a better experience. You know, you can't take your um, desktop to the store, but you can start in your office and move 
um, as you commute to um, to a Walgreens, check your inventory, make sure it's there, um, or find which one's closer. Um, there's quite a few in this area, so you could hit a bunch um, or just check out the first one you see. Um, but yeah, we, we see customers um, doing a little bit of research. I know our products, you don't necessarily have to research the toothbrush you're gonna buy, um, but as bigger ticket items, um, we see customers going through and, and checking reviews and um, making that, or understanding a little bit more before they purchase something in and the it, store. And it's a frank, I believe, be right with you. I, with, with prescriptions, I know I can order that on my app and it's got the data for me to know that my penicillin or my antibiotic is there and I could just walk into the one state of Madison and done. Yep. Yeah, which is kind of nice, integration. Yeah, um, yeah you, you can either pick up your prescription bottle and scan it um, and it's ready within an hour. Um, or you could just do a quick, um, if you you have an account with us, you can do a quick one tap um, and it's ready to go. It's actually faster to just tap on your um, on your app than actually pick up the prescription bottle. Um, but people enjoy the scan factor of um, refilling their prescription, so we offer both. They enjoy that factor. Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> so, so for us, the, uh, the offline, um, Piece. I mean, this is kind of central to what what it is we're proposing from a, a data analysis standpoint. So the acquirers, the the FIs, they're, they're all the, the standard model tends to be offline. What we're trying to do is is educate them to, to move toward online from from the acquiring standpoint. So the customer acquisition, um, utilizing those those data elements to actually you know onboarding those customers um, is is kind of the key piece. So we're almost trying to get rid of. But again, it's, it's a different paradigm to the consumer um, side of things, yeah. Well, and just to feed off of what Ch um, Chester Ritchie just said during his talk, how do you see it working with the international, with international chains in Britain, France, US, whatever? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, if you're in uh, payment acceptance, you, you really need to tie yourself up with somebody who's in that domain for, for card payment acceptance. Um, we, we've partnered with the right partners in, in the mobile space that have got, you know, EMV co-certifications for contact, contactless worldwide. Uh, by the, the card authority bodies. Um, we, we consider them to be the best. They're kind of tried and tested. And if you don't align yourselves with them, you know, you've got that complexity of the processing platforms that, that the gentleman before us talked to. Uh, but beyond that, there's another level. There's, there's the certification, um, you know, is the device legitimate? I mean, you really want to narrow down the scope of everything that you're doing for payment acceptance if you have an, an international um, strategy, yeah. Okay, and then we are at the time when they're about to hook us, I think, Tim. <laughs> and yeah, let me ask you to just to finish up. And my favorite question, as you know, from this morning, five years from now, what do you think is the change that we haven't thought about or talked about so far that's going to be most apparent to all of us standing here or sitting here? For um, I'll, I'll go. Sure, um, please. Uh, standardization, I think, in five years from now, it's not going to be all of these different uh, as the gentleman that spoke before us uh, had alluded to. There's, you know, the, I think he had said a, a client of his had 27 different payment processors in 27 different countries. I think yeah. that there's going to be a consolidation as the uh, regulatory requirements catch up with the industry as we have these new technologies coming on board. Um, standardization is going to, in five years from now, from now we're going to be laughing that, uh, you know, we had all these disparate uh, ways to pay. Um, from a tech side, I think voice recognition for payments, I think that's, that's coming. Um, I think that social media and messaging apps for payments, I, I, I think that's coming. I, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, apps like that, I think that uh, will become prevalent here in the coming years. Um, and ultimately, I mean, tokenization is going to, dis is disrupting the financial, uh, financial system as we know it. And I think that that's just going to continue for the unforeseen future. Kate? I, I think um, retailers were, will finally be more equipped um, with payments. I think we'll see a lot of store associates um, already aware that you walked in the store um, and they'll be able to tailor your experience for you. So, you, you know, Kate walked in and you know she always buys Boots products, you'll have that ready. Um, everything will be more seamless um, and a, a better um, user-based data experience. I think knowing what I've purchased in the past, um, knowing what I gravitate towards will become more um, obvious to retailers through data. 
Um, and I think that will that will help um, encourage you a walk in walk out um, type of idea in a retail store. And you get to finish this up, Ben. Yeah, so, so I think the, the dilution between the, the notion of a business entity and an individual, um, P2P payments is where we'll be. If you look at job creation in the US, you know, small business is driving that. I think the, the notion of a, a merchant processing relationship is under immense risk. I think if you look at the visa APIs for debit to debit, credit to credit, payment transfer, you know, peripherals, I mean, even EMV to that extent becomes kind of uh, unnecessary. If you look into the weeds of what they're doing and, and you look at where the, the job creation and, and revenue is, it's not um, huge conglomerates, it's, it's small businesses. And I think that is going to be a, a massive innovator in, in mobile payments, the, the P2P space. Yeah. Cool. That's one last word here. I want to thank everybody for listening to us for a bit here. I hope you learned something. I want to thank Benjamin and Jared and Kate. Thank you so much for coming and participating today. Appreciate it very much. And Tim, all yours. Thank you.